Some people say that the media you consume is like a mirror. Well, I looked into the mirror, and you know what my reflection said? It said, I told you when you woke up this morning that you were a piece of shit. And I said, that's right, and I'm going to prove it to you again. We're going to read Iceman number eight. Thank you, Lewis Black. This is part of Marvel's Legacy run, so we have this pointless part one of part one titling. So it's a one shot, except it's not actually a one shot because it's a continuation of the title numbering. And it's not a standalone story either because it continues the previous storyline. So it's just there to take up space. We've also got some false advertisement with this crap about Iceman vs. Iceman. That never happens. What we get is older Iceman proving he's the ultimate douchebag. And as I go through this, just remember, older Bobby is supposed to be a hero. He's supposed to be a good guy. Just keep that in mind. So we start off with another pointless battle. I've mentioned this in all my reviews of this book. You can take out the fights and it wouldn't change a thing because they don't matter. At least this time that's obvious. Cena Grace wrote the scene featuring now alive Pyro ranting about mutant rights while the two Bobbies chit-chat about young Bobby's boyfriend, Romeo. See, the problem is Romeo. That's not a joke. The boy's name is actually Romeo because writers be lazy. Romeo hasn't called or texted young Bobby in a while, and you don't actually give a shit about this. I get what Grace was trying to do here with the battle banter, but it just sounds silly because there's no context. Why would they have this very personal conversation now in the middle of a fight? Did it start before the fight? Could we see that set up? Isn't young Bobby halfway across the world? How did he get back to New York? Where is he staying? It's just so weird. Weirder is that older Bobby threatens to beat up a 15 year old boy for not returning phone calls. He says, hey, best of both worlds idea. I beat that star-crossed ghosting snob for making baby me feel gloomy and you kiss it better. What bothers me more than the weirdness of that dialogue and the threats against a teenager is that older Bobby calls the 15 year old version of himself baby. No teen boy wants an adult, especially one he looks up to, to call him a baby. But young Bobby doesn't say anything about it. He doesn't even make a grandpa or old man clap back. He just lets it slide like no 15 year old ever would. So then grandpa Bobby tells the younger one that he's buttering him up for a favor And surprisingly, it's not group sex. Instead, it's that older Bobby's mom found out about the younger one and wants to meet him. We never get the conversation about how they approached Bobby about this. That would have been interesting to see, especially with how the last time they talked ended. Why would you even take the phone call? Why would you even agree to ask your teenage counterpart? You could barely deal with how your parents reacted. Why would you put that on a kid who just found out he can never go home? Because, ladies and gentlemen... Older Bobby is an asshole. Specifically, he's a stereotypical 1995 gay asshole. He's probably lisping, but we can't hear that because it's a book. But he's got all the cattiness and insensitivity that every 90s gay schmuck had. Remember, he's supposed to be a hero. So like any good hero, he decides to pitch this idea of his younger self meeting his anti-mutant, anti-gay parents in the middle of a fight. Now, You already know this is just playing out writer Cena Grace's fantasies. This scenario can never happen in real life, but I'm sure it's crossed the mind of many a gay person whose parents flipped out when they came out. How would they react if they met a younger me? That's what this is going to turn into, but before we get to that, this week on Spacey's Kids, ironically gayer mutant Kevin Spacey teaches It's Your Boy Zach to steal and keep quiet while getting screwed like every good little twink should. This whole pointless scene is like a sexual predator primer on how to groom teen boys. Jesus Christ. Dakin literally puts his foot in the boy's ass. What else do you want? How much you want to bet Brian Singer's taking notes and he'll add in an unnecessary shower scene with Zach and Dakin in the next movie? Moving on. Bobby heads to the dinner with the folks while texting his fuck bud Judah. Judah says, wait, there's really another you out there in the world? And then Bobby says, yes, and please no smutty jokes, 
I've hurt them all, and he's underage. Oh, like that's a problem for you. But that's not the one. This is the one. Judas says, Oh, fine. So let's recap. Bobby's grinder hookup is disappointed that he can't make sex jokes about a young Bobby. Meanwhile, older Bobby pretends to have standards when it comes to jokes, even though his whole shtick is inappropriate jokes. Come on, Grace. Bobby is supposed to be a kitschy 90s gay dude. There's no way he's not making no sex jokes. None. Anyway, they start this bullshit dinner and young Bobby is nowhere to be found. Older Bobby texts him and finds out that the boy is in the restroom with a little problem. He's so nervous, he's got an ice hard on, on his whole body. It's actually kind of clever, and it would have been funny if Grace had just stuck with young Bobby's powers going wonky because of his nerves. Instead, he goes into his typical ranting and wastes a good joke. Older Bobby drags the younger one out to the table and proceeds to make fun of him. Look who's a little embarrassed by his frosted tips. Right. So you have a kid who's embarrassed to the point that he can't shut off his powers, and your way of dealing with this is to embarrass him further. Asshole. The parents ignore this and dote all over young Bobby with his mom pinching his cheek. How old are you, woman? No mother does this. Grandma, maybe. A distant aunt you haven't seen since you were in diapers? Not your mom. Now, here's where older Bobby proves himself to be the total douchebag. I'm just going to lay out the scene with no jokes and then give you Bobby's response. The parents refer to older Bobby as other Bobby, which offends him. Young Bobby asks if this makes him the time-displaced prodigal son, to which older Bobby warns him about using Bible talk with dad. The young one makes a joke about showing up to Sunday school in his ice form. His mother says he could go to church with them or even come back home. She says he could stay with them, finish high school, and pursue his dreams. Dad even says they got a room for him in the house he's never seen. To which older Bobby laughs. He goes on this monologue about how at first he was jealous because of the attention young Bobby was getting, but now realizes it was a trap. He says, you found the perfect version of your son to start over with. Then he asks how they would explain the younger version of himself, and his mother says that they live in a new neighborhood and they could pass him off as his nephew. Bobby then says, quote, you two are freaking mental. Why? What I said is exactly what happened in the scene. His parents never once mentioned Bobby's sexuality. They never mentioned his powers. They never mentioned him being an X-Man. They're just offering their time display son a chance to live a normal life. What's mental about that? It's what most parents would want for their kids. No, douchebag Bobby loses it and monologues about himself. This is really just an extension of the previous arguments they've had about Bobby being a mutant and being gay. We're eight issues in, and we've already seen this argument at least four times. You don't need to do it again. But here Bobby is, losing his shit because his parents offer young Bobby a room in their house. Asshole. He says to his dad, Do you even know what I wanted when I was his age? Do you? I bet it wasn't Dick. Just saying. Now this whole time, no one's paid any attention to the other person sitting at the table. Like typical adults, they just talk about him like he's not there. When they finally notice young Bobby, he's literally frozen to his seat. Mom says, Bobby, he's frozen himself. Douchebag Bobby says, narrate the scene much, Mom? Bored Eyes Dad says, don't talk to your mother that way, Robert. And actually, Dad has a point. How are you going to call your mom out after that monologue? So to get young Bobby to defrost, Jackass Bobby talks about how old-timey his folks are. It's not even that it's bad, it's just out of place. His parents haven't said anything hurtful to either Bobby at this dinner. They're giving broke dick Bobby the space that he wants, and they're offering still sane Bobby a stable, well, no, they're actually kind of crazy, an intact home. It's not the best thing ever, but it's not an attack. Now here's a question. How different are these two really? I ask only because Kevin Spacey here whispers that he knows what jailbait Bobby wants to be which is a pastry chef, which I'm guessing we're supposed to think is code for gay. Whatever. Somehow, though, talking about this deeply held secret desire is what makes Bobby lose his ice boner. Wouldn't he be more embarrassed? You can tell this was written by someone who doesn't interact with young people much just by that moment. So they peel Bobby out of his ice, which is still somehow not embarrassing to him, and his mother from another dimension tries to make peace, and he blows her off. He snaps on his folks for no reason. Dude, they haven't done anything to you. 
They just offered you a room. If this is what they were like before, yeah, they're weird, but that's about it. No, Mr. Man has to tell them. Next time, I'll be in my ice form on purpose, and I'm bringing my boyfriend, who hasn't texted you in weeks, whom I kiss in public, bitch. And in what has to be an accidental admission by Cena Grace of his dated storyline, Will and Grace Bobby says, I'll get him to 90s acceptable gay while y'all handle the check. Um, 90s acceptable gay would have him decked out in rave gear, angel wings, glow sticks, and piles of ecstasy. Let's not do that. Especially since that usually leads to fucking him, and even though he's technically you, it's still weird, and it's a felony. So they leave and go back to the X-Mansion, and the two Bobbies banter before douchebag Bobby calls his younger self Micro Frosty. This is like the fifth time older Bobby calls young Bobby baby or little or toddler. What teenager would let you get away with that? Parents, you know what I'm talking about. Anybody who has younger siblings or cousins or friends, y'all know what I'm talking about. Anybody who's actually a teenager, I know I got some listening. You definitely know what I'm talking about. Those of you without kids, let me explain this. No kid wants to be called a baby. Period. It's like encoded into their DNA to get pissed if you call them a baby. Even four-year-olds will check you on this. Parents, you know I'm right. Seriously, find a preschooler and say to the kid's parents, not even to the kid himself, just in his presence, say, he's such a smart baby, or he's like a baby you. That preschooler will say with a quickness, I'm not a baby. Now try this with someone who's just a couple of years away from being an adult. Go up to a 15 or 16 year old boy you're cool with and try calling him little or toddler or micro. Do you want me to send you a Ziploc bag for you to put your teeth in? I know this seems like a nitpick, but honestly, it makes no sense for young Bobby not to say anything about it. At least return the favor. Nope. He doesn't say a thing. Not even a quick clap back like any normal teenager would do. I get that Cena Grace probably doesn't have kids and doesn't know a lot about kids, but honestly, He's been a kid. There's no way he would have taken that when he was a teenager. Little things like this just pull you right out of the little story that there is because it rings so false. Especially with the young X-Men who are all self-conscious about the differences between them and their older selves. It's like Edward Elric not saying anything when someone calls him short. I don't buy it. We do get this one great scene though in the X-Mansion. Older Bobby's walking butt plug drops by from LA for a dated film reference no one under 25 would get. Then he gets tackled by Colossus. Bobby's like, Peter, no, that's my special friend. Yes, Peter. Take his ass down. Finish him. Finish him. This is probably the best issue out of the bunch, and that's not saying much. But still, nothing happens. Think about it. Neither Bobby wants anything to do with their parents. The parents don't accept older Bobby as gay or a mutant. They only see young Bobby as a chance for a do-over. After they meet for dinner, where do things line up? Neither Bobby wants anything to do with their parents. The parents don't accept older Bobby as gay or a mutant. They only see young Bobby as a chance for a do-over. Other than young Bobby losing control over his powers, we got nothing new in this story. Nothing changed. We didn't meet any new characters. We didn't gain any new insights. You know what would have been interesting? If young Bobby, out of a desire to have some connection to his old life, decided to make it work with his other parents. We could have seen how it didn't work. We could have had moments between his parents, especially his dad, maybe seeing things from a different perspective. What if Grace had saved Romeo ignoring Bobby until he was living with his parents? Then his folks would see the impact it would have on him. What if it was his dad who came around first? What if that was the point? where he saw Bobby's pain over rejection, and he finally began to soften. Yeah, it's a little cliched, but it was still work. So much wasted opportunity with the story, but at least we got to see the person the story should really be about, even if it was only long enough for his older self to constantly insult him. I'm shocked he didn't buy the boy a pack of diapers and a pacifier. I'm also surprised this book is still going because there's nothing to it. This is exactly what happens when your story is only about identity politics. Once you get it set up and have the confrontation, there's nowhere else to go. You can have Bobby move to the other gay mecca. Doesn't matter. You can have him in relationships. Doesn't matter. You're just going to keep telling the same scenarios over and over because you've got nothing else to work with. This is supposed to be a superhero book. Our hero, if you can call him that, 
is an asshole, an unlikable, dated stereotype of a gay man. So far, he hasn't faced any real dangers, any life-changing situations, any actual risks. The closest things that we got were the purifiers, but those were just cliché caricatures. Where's the heroism? Where's the cost? What is Bobby sacrificing? That's what superhero books are about. At the very least, you could have fight scenes, but even those are hit or miss. This is what happens when you take a third-rate character and let someone with no skill try to tell a story around them. You show exactly why the character is third-rate. This is barely enough for a subplot in a regular book. If Marvel isn't going to cancel this book, and it seems like they're not, find another writer. Give it to someone who can at least make it interesting. Hell, give it to Mags Visaggio. Mags knows how to write crazy people. But what do I know? I'm just some guy.